Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a privilege and an opportunity to get to come here and speak to you. For those of you guys who don't know who I am, I'm the student pastor here. Um, I know that some of you guys may be a little bit confused because it seemed like Probably about eight months ago, a new student pastor showed up who had a beard, and then uh, it's maybe another student pastor showed up, you're not sure, because then there was this, like, this high school kid baptizing other students. Um, no, that was me. Um, actually, when I came here, I did have a beard, um, but then I shaved it off. And then, so now I look really, really young, and um, it doesn't help that um, not only do I just did I shave, but I actually do look really, really young. And in fact... Um, I've ran into that problem uh, quite a few times. Uh, I get ID'd for everything, and I mean everything. Like, there's things you get ID'd for you didn't know you get ID'd for. And I get ID'd for them. Let me give you an example. Um, I go to Walmart to buy a game camera, because uh, one of the things I love to do is fish and hunt. And I go in there to buy a game camera. Well, did you know you have to be over the age of 16 to buy a game camera? <laughs> yeah. So when the high school kid asks me, am I over the age of 16, it really hurt. It really hurt really deep because I know I look young, but I didn't know I looked that young. So um, I said, yeah, I am. So I pulled out my ID. I gave my ID to this high school kid, and uh, he goes, yeah, you, your birthday's in like the 90s, so you're at this, to him, I'm an old fart, you know, so, but it's all good. Um, so... It's an opportunity and just a privilege to get to come here and, and speak to you. Um, just right off the bat, I'm super thankful for this church. I'm super thankful for my wonderful wife. who I couldn't even be up here talking if she wasn't back there doing what she's doing today, running the live stuff. There's so much stuff that happens on uh, and goes on at this church behind the scenes that so many people don't say. And I'm super thankful for our, just our incredible pastor here. Just what you see on Sunday morning, he's an amazing speaker. He does a lot of amazing things. But I'll tell you this, he's also an amazing shepherd of shepherds. He shepherds both Jake and myself. And he, he comes in and he just provides so much aid to us. And I can't even tell you how, what, how great of a pastor he is even behind the scenes. Um, you just see what he comes and does on Sunday mornings. I'm telling you, he, you're just so blessed to have uh, Edward as a pastor here, and I'm super thankful. My wife and I have been super blessed since the minute that we got here, um, from, the, from your elders to some of you guys that are sitting in this room, and we are so thankful. We were given a privilege and an opportunity to go back home and visit for, uh, during the holidays, and um, there's a lot of things that, you know, you go, you, you go through Thanksgiving, you realize, man, I'm super thankful for Thanksgiving, but then there's those things, right? Where, Brother, where Pastor Edward was talking about last week, you know, um, there's just those people in the family that sometimes it's hard to get along with, but yet we know that God wants us to get along with them, like we're to be a blessing. We're to be a blessing to them, and I think that all the way from, through Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, God has purposed this plan for us to be a blessing to those around us, including our enemies, and that sometimes is really hard, but this morning I want to talk about who sang the first song and why that ties into us being a blessing to everyone around us. So if you'll track with me, we'll get to who sang the first song. But before we get there, I want to tell you about a date night that I had recently. Every other week, my wife and I take Saturday nights to go on a date night. And we try to mix it up and do different things. Well, we, we have a place that we always seem to end up. Does anyone else seem to always end up at the same restaurant on date night. 
Well, we do, and we ended up at Olive Garden. We've got that place down to a T. We know exactly how, what food to order to take home for our food tomorrow. Like, we've got this thing down. Do we want extra breadsticks? Of course we want extra breadsticks because we're going to pack them up. Do we want extra soup and extra salad? Well, of course we do because we're taking it home, you know? We've got this down to, I know, hey, come on, some of you guys do it too, you know? <laughs> Just... I'm just saying, and we love Olive Garden. I, I've learned, guys, hey, those of you guys in here, you're like, I hate Olive Garden. That is a sissy's restaurant. Listen to me. There you can go and you can get the tour of Italy or the chicken. Um, like there is certain things you can get that's got more meat on it than anything else on the menu. And it's, it's the things you want. So if you need some su- Olive Garden menu suggestions, see me after church. I've got a whole list of them. So, We were on a date night, and then after we had spent a wonderful evening at Olive Garden, we decided to do what any good couple should do. We went to Barnes & Nobles. We went to Barnes & Nobles to look for a book that I could read when I was deer hunting. Um, And so we would go in this store, and we began to look. Well, we realize and remember that Christmas is coming up. And as we began to wonder, we realized two hours later as we leave the store that we had been at Barnes & Nobles for two hours. But while we were there... My wife follows all kinds of people on Instagram and Twitter and and other things that I don't even know exist. She follows all these people, and on there she had found this uh, Christian uh, kind of singer. She sings music and stuff, and she wrote a book that she wanted to get from my sister who's about to have her first child. So I'm about to become an uncle. I'm super excited about that. Um, She's the first one of my siblings to have kids. And so she goes in there looking for this specific book, and it's called, Who Sang the First Song? And I thought, oh, really? That's the book you're going to get her? And so I, being super awesome and everything, go and look for another book. And I found a Disney book. It talked about where the Wookiees lived, and I got that for her. But... My wife got this book, being sweet and nice and kind that she is, and then after we had read it, I realized her book was a lot better than my book. But I want to read this book to you today. I'm not going to read it to you yet. I'm going to share it with you a story, and then I'm going to read this book to you. Because as she began to read that book, it really began to inspire me. It began to inspire me, and and, and as we went through the week, um, we, we got an opportunity to read this book to several different people, and I'm going to share with you some of these things. But before we do, John chapter 4, verse 23. In John chapter 4, verse 23, it says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. When I read this scripture this week, I said, That's it. That's the verse. I could, I could preach just on that verse right there. I love that verse because one of my favorite chapters in the entire, chapter, or the entire Bible is Revelation 5. I love it because it paints from Genesis to Revelation what God's purpose and design is for us as people. To have a relationship with God, but most, more so importantly, to be worshipers of God. Now, now some of us fellows in here, as the worship comes on, we begin to feel a little bit uncomfortable because we think, you know, it's just like singing's not really our thing. And we're definitely not going to be raising our hands or anything like that. But when we look at the scripture and we begin to read through scripture, we, we realize that God wants us to be worshipers. He wants us to be worshipers, and, and worship is so much more than music, it's so much more than lifting your hands, it's so much more than shouting praises, but it's, it's, it's a way of lifestyle, and as we look through Genesis to Revelation, we begin to see that God has woven in this purpose and design for humanity to, to worship Him, and I love how it, t- it just comes to an end and closing in Revelation 5, where it says, you know, every name and tongue and nation and tribe will be standing there in the throne room. And it says the four living creatures fell down and worshiped him. And so as I go through this holiday season, and, and I know I've got to preach on Sunday, because it seems like every time I've got to preach, it's like uh, it's, it's right after a holiday. I can never figure out why they always pick me to do that. But... I'm working, through, I'm working through this message, and as I'm working through this re- message, I'm just, I, I begin to become so thankful for the things that God has given me. I'm thinking through this message, and I'm watching my family. 
I'm thinking through this message, and, and I'm watching my in-laws. My in-laws who had a huge part to play in me coming to know Christ. So if you guys have heard my story, and you know that uh, my, my in-laws were, were, had a, such a, a pivotal part. They played such a crucial part in me seeing and, and understanding love. And, and I'm watching my family and how thankful I am for my father. And I'm just beginning to watch it. And then, and then I come back to this, honestly, just some incredible people. I, I really, I do, I think you guys are incredible and I began to think to myself, like, what did I do to get an opportunity? Because I remember sitting in, in, in an audience as a teenager, watching speakers who, who I admired and loved and trusted. And now one of them's coming and speaking at our D now. And I began to think, and I began to realize what God was doing in my life and, and pouring and stirring my heart. And all I could think as a young man is, man, I really would like to share what God's doing in my life. And now to get an opportunity to come up and to do that and to share with people Man, it's just such a blessing that I can't even tell you what it feels like. And out of the words, the best way I've ever heard it put was by another pastor. He said, I'm like a tortoise stuck on a fence post. I have absolutely no idea how I got here. But man, the view sure is good. And that to me is how I feel so often. In youth ministry was I get to watch kids grow um, from junior high to senior high and graduate. I get to watch kids who, man, I just dreaded coming into the youth ministry, come through the youth ministry, man. They're, let's just be honest, not all teenagers were made equal. And then they, they're just, they're just, they're that one kid. And, you know, and, and I love them to death, but then they come through. And then by the time they're a senior, man, their hearts just dug and sink, sinks into God. And all of a sudden, you're having to hold them back from, from busting through doors and telling people about Jesus. And I never want to hold a student back. That's a different story for a different time. But it's just amazing and the opportunity you get to see and watch students just come to know Christ and then you get the questions like, when are you going to be a real pastor? That's not a question you should ask a youth pastor, by the way. Because the truth and the answer is, I don't have any plans anytime soon. But the truth is, I love doing what I do and I'm so thankful for it. And as I began to think about who sang the first song, I want to talk about three things this morning. First off, it was God who sang the first song. Second off, that God creates us to sing a new song. And then third off, that God has created us to sing for eternity. Those are three things I want to cover, three simple points this morning. We'll go over one more time. That God sang the first song. That God created us to sing a new song and that we will be singing for all of eternity. Those are the three things that I think that he has woven through Scripture and purposed for our life. He has created from Adam and Eve, he created with a purpose saying, I need you to worship me. And then he goes to Abraham and he, and he goes on and on and on. And it says God sang the first song. I, I believe that God sang the first song and I know this from John 1.1. 1, 1. It's such a familiar passage for so many of us where we say in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And man, as a Christian, you read that scripture, and you just realize how powerful it is. Like, you mean before I can even imagine there was a beginning, there was a beginning. And like, even before that, there was a beginning. Like, God is the alpha, and then he ends it as the omega, like he's always existed and he's been singing the first song before. And, and those of you guys that are maybe having some um, trouble with what I'm saying, I sing. Look, sing can mean all kinds of things. When I'm saying sing, I'm talking about worshiping God. When I'm saying sing, I'm talking about our hearts rejoicing and gladness of who God is. Man, it, it's, it's looking and, and, and glorifying God. And so when we look, we realize that God was glorifying God even from the beginning. It's always been about him and it always will be about him. In Zephaniah 3, 17, it says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will, he will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you over the loud singing. As we look there, we realize that God has been singing to us, he's singing the song, and it's the song that we're to worship him, and that we would worship, he, he in, in turn is singing to us, and it's just this beautiful, beautiful picture of what we were created to do. You see, God created us to sing a new song. 
Not only is he singing the song, not only was he the one who first began to sing, and he'll be the one that, that, that the, he'll also be the omega, but also he created us to sing. So sing out your thanks to him. Sing praises to our God. And I would say with that, your tone is everything. I talked about this with the students on Wednesday night. It works like this. Christmas is coming up. You, you go to Christmas and that, and that family member gets you a present. And you, as you open that present, this is your expression. Oh. Thank you. And you put it away. Now, I would ask you, is that a tone of appreciation? No. And if somebody did that to you, you're thinking, I messed up. I did not, obviously, I did not get the right, and you're not going to feel very good about it. But if someone opens your gift, and they begin to open it, and they go, wow, this is incredible. Thank you so much. I've always wanted this. It's a completely different tone. So I would say that when we're talking about Psalms 147.7, when we're talking about John 4.23, tone is everything. You, those of us in here are married, tone is everything. How you say it goes a long ways. And so I would say this, how you worship God is everything. But more importantly, your tone are your feelings toward him. They're how you, how you worship him. There's nothing wrong with those of us in here who, honestly, we just, we're not an expressive person. Listen, I don't think anywhere in scriptures is telling, telling you to jump pews. But I do think it's telling you that, man, your heart, it ought to be beaten out of the ch your chest for God. I mean, you're talking about the God of the universe. And one thing that might help you with this worship concept, man, think about who God is. The exercise I always do with my students is I always tell them to close their eyes. I want everyone in this room just close your eyes for just a second. Now, what do you want you to do? Maybe you've been to Mount Everest, I don't know. Maybe you've been to the St. Louis Arch. Maybe you've been to the Seattle uh, Space Needle. Maybe you've been um, to the Niagara Falls. I want you to think of the biggest thing that you can possibly think of. The biggest thing that you've ever looked off of. Something that just took your breath away. I want you to think about that object. I know for me, it was when I was in the St. Louis Arch, man, that was just so high up. I could never imagine anything bigger than that. And I want, you to, I want you to picture that object now. I just want you to make that object twice as big. Now I want you to make that object three times as big. And if you could dare even go, can you make that object four times as big? Can your mind continue to stretch it? Now I want you to think about the universe. And, I tell them, and as I talk to my students, I tell them, I said, I want you to picture that universe. And we know as we know about the universe, is, is it just continually seems to be expanding and growing. It's infinite. Now take that universe, can you stretch it out and make it even bigger? And then when I tell my students, I say, now open your eyes. And I say, now I want you to imagine God. He's infinitely bigger than the thing that you're thinking about. That God of the universe is absolutely huge. He's an amazing God, and some of the best advice that was ever given to me was by one of my uncles who said, David, God is a whole lot bigger than you think he is. Yeah, I want you to think about God, and I want you to imagine. Now he's a whole lot bigger than that. Now, it seems like such a simple concept, but it, it's, it's really not. You see, God is huge, and a God that big deserves to be worshipped and revered. One of the greatest examples I've seen was in, was in one of, is not in one of my college books, but it's a systematic theology book that I picked up. And the way it had is it had a graph, and the, graph, the line graph went like this, and you started right here. And then you were born right here, and then you came to know Christ and you began life. Once you began life, it began. You had God, His holiness, your understanding of Him. And as you began to grow and as you began to mature, you went along this journey. You got it right about here and you, maybe you got baptized. Some people came along in your life and you, and you matured. But at this point in your life, you look back and you looked at, back at God's holiness. And you look back and you looked back at who God was. And as you look back at God, you realize something. God's holiness got a whole lot bigger. And God got a whole lot bigger. 
And as you mature and you grow on and some people invest in you, maybe, maybe for you it's not your in-laws, maybe for you it's someone else, maybe a pastor, maybe someone came along beside you, it was just a friend. And as you mature and you grow in your faith and you get right about here and you realize all of a sudden, wow, God was a whole lot bigger than you thought he was when it went right back here. And God's holiness is a whole lot bigger than you thought it was right back here. And as you grow and as you mature and as you realize this graph never ends. It's infinite and it goes on forever and ever and ever. And then you say, why should I worship the God of this universe? The reason you should worship the God of this universe is everything is created to worship him. I mean, everything. And, and so I think it's interesting, though, that we can go to football games and we can go to all these other activities. And, and, and listen, I'm going to tread on this lightly. I realize we're in Texas here. But football is not God. And... And whether your kid gets a scholarship to a school or not, is not everything. Why can we go to those activities, pack out a stadium, go crazy? Man, we'll paint our faces in half, each color on each side. We'll get there an hour before the game, 30 minutes before the game. We'll camp out. We'll have an entire barbecue. And then, and, then, and then the game comes, man, we'll get excited, we'll yell, we'll scream, we'll shout. But then we get to Sunday morning. And it's like, then you have to ask yourself, what's greater, God or the football game? And so many of us, are, and you, we say God, but our actions are not saying God. They're saying the football game. And then what I tell my students is this, I say, hey, listen, you can't have both. And this is a real hard thing to swallow, and you can't get mad at me for saying this. This is what the scripture says. One of my life verses, Luke 9, 23, if any man wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross daily. For if a man gains his life, he will surely lose it. But if a man loses his life, he will surely find it. So in other words, what scripture is telling me, I gotta lose my life to find it, which means that if I gain anything else in this world, that I'll lose it. So that means if I take anything and put a priority over God, then I lose it. So, it goes right back down to saying, hey, I can't have both God and football. Nothing wrong with football, nothing wrong with going to the games. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But what I am saying is, one has to be a priority over the other because you can't love both God and money. You gotta love one or the other. You know, I just think it's interesting because I think in church we, 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 we get this idea that we have to be civilized. And there's nothing wrong with, uh, like I said, everyone expresses their, their love for God in different ways, and I'm, I'm not trying to cater to one side or the other, but what I am saying is your heart. Your heart should be inclined to worship who God is, and not just through the worships that we sing here. I mean, some, some of the greatest times that I worship God is when I'm alone, and I, and I love to hike. I'm a hobby fanatic. I have so many hobbies that I've got to drop some. But the thing is, some of the best times for me to worship God so when I get alone, maybe it's on top of a mountain. There's not so many mountains here in East Texas, but <laughs> right now it's when I get out alone on the lake and I begin to appreciate what God has created. And I'll tell you, my heart sings. My heart sings to this God of this universe and I realize he's a really big God. And what he created is really special. But I think, you know, I believe that the church people, so many of us have become so civilized in order to create a safety net in our own life of security creating a religious mask that is hiding the transparency of their own feelings. Afraid that if the imperfections of them being human were to be revealed, that, that might somehow destroy their very foundation of their identity. That this has created, and I believe, a very dangerous underlining culture. Because I, I really, really believe that, that God used some of the most imperfect, unperfect, unprofessional people in the Bible. I mean, we look at Abraham and, and, and we, look at, we look at, you know, Isaac and Jacob and every one of those, if you look at them, they were all messed up. I mean, I mean, read through the Old Testament and you'll begin to think, are these the same Bible stories that I was hearing when I was a kid in Sunday school? Because this is not what I remember. I mean, it's crazy, this stuff that's in Genesis and Exodus I mean, it's absolutely insane as you look through that, but, I'm, but the familiar thread is even from, from Adam, God said, go be fruitful and multiply. Go be a blessing to those 
who are cursed to you. Be a blessing. And so he goes to Abraham and says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Then he promises that same promise to Isaac. Then he promises that same promise to Jacob. Then he promises that same promise to Joseph. And he also promises to Judah. And it goes on and on all the way to David. And then we get a savior king, Jesus Christ. But that same promise that he continues to thread all the way throughout the Old Testament and then into the New Testament is this. Go and those who, I will bless those who bless you. And then as Christians, we inherit that same promise that we are to go forth and to spread his name. But that name that we are to spread is to live out this purpose, is to worship him. I love this quote, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That quote messed me up for a little bit because I, it, had, it didn't sit right theologically with me and I had to work through it. And I'm kind of a thinker and I overthink everything. And as I began to under, try to understand that quote, I was real big into trying to figure out what, what was God's purpose was for my life. Was I going to be going and spending the rest of my life in Africa or was I going to be a youth pastor? And so as I'm working through that quote, I'm really big into missions. And I think what's more important than going forth? How beautiful are the feet of those who go and share the good news? You know, God wants the people to know and I couldn't understand why. And I also couldn't understand like what, there was this underlining emphasis that, that worship was more important than missions. And I couldn't understand why. And as I began to study scripture and as I began to think about that, I began to realize that, that what God created us to do was to worship him. The reason we go forward, the reason that we spread his good news to people, the reason we risk it all, whether it be our lives or our belongings, our possession, the reason we risk it all and we, we, we sell everything we have and do whatever it takes, maybe it's to go to the far reaches of the earth to share his good news is because this, he's worth it, he's a God who deserves to be worshipped. And that's why we go. And when we are most satisfied in God, he is most satisfied in us. Because that's what he created us to do, was to worship him. And that's the reason I love Revelation 5. Hopefully some of you guys go home and read that today. But I want to, say, I want to read this book to you. And then I'm going to give it away. This book right here is the book that my wife picked up in the bookstore. Who sang the first song? And I really do. I, I love this book. I've come to love this book. It's a children's book, obviously. So don't expect some great epiphany. But I love this book. Because I think it tells, it tells such a great story. In fact, we have a, we have a church friend who um, was, my, was one of my wife's family's real close friends. Always been there through some really hard times. And, and he got really sick this week as we went home. The doctor... There's several things going on, and, and the doctor said that there's nothing we can do. It's just a waiting game from here on out. So of you have known someone who's been in that position. And he just said, hey, it's just a waiting game. Had him in the hospital. Next place, one day later, they moved him to hospice. And so it was just, they knew he had days, hours. And he died on Thanksgiving. But we went and visited him. The first person we went and visited as we drove in, we went up to the hospital, visited him, and said, my wife said, wait, 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 wait. She goes to the back of the car, opens the back of the car. She grabs this book. And she goes and grabs a book and she said, and I said, what are you doing with that book? This guy's like seven years old. He doesn't want to hear a children's story. She goes, no, yeah, 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 he does. And so she grabs a book, she goes up there and right before we visit with him a little bit and, and uh, Lauren goes, hey, can I read you a story? So I want to read you the story she read him. It says, who sang the first song? Who hummed the first tune? Was it the wind blowing past the silvery moon? Were the stars making noise as they sparkled at night? Did the, sing, did the sun sing a song as it cooled the sky? Did the waves make a song as they crashed the shore? Or was it the whales? Or the lion's first roar? Did the first flowers hum as they burst into bloom? Or was it the first song when the thunder went boom? Maybe elephants running loud over the ground. Or maybe the birds made the first singing sound. All these guesses we've made are quite good, but they're wrong. It was God our maker who sang the first song. 
When God made the earth, he decided to sing, and he wrote his song into everything. God sang. Song says, you're good, you're wonderfully made, and I'll never stop loving you all of your days. So I want you to sing with your life and your voice, for I created the earth to make a joyful noise. So now we know who sang the first song. God who made us knew all along that every heart and everything was born with a song it was made to sing. And as she read that to him, you know, I thought, how cool. Here's a man who I know in my heart has a relationship with Christ. He's smiling. He's ready to go. He says, you know, it's not the hospice house that I'm looking forward to. It's the house after that. He's smiling. There's just this confidence. And as you, you're in situations like that, you can't help but think of your own death. But as I began to think of that, I began to think about Genesis and I began to think about Abraham and I began to think about Isaac and I began to think about Jacob and I began to think about Joseph and I began to think about David and I began to think about Revelation and Paul and Peter and I began to think about this song that God wove through all of creation. That God had a purpose and a plan for all of us and that we would sing for this song of all eternity that when this, this man was going to die and pass away, the first thing he was going to do was begin to sing this song. And I began to think about Revelation chapter 5, but just even before that in Revelation 4, 9 through 11, it says, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, 24 elders fall down before him, who is seated on the throne and worship him, who who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, Lord, to receive in glory and honor and power, and created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Man, we start the book that way, and we finish the book that way. In Revelation 15, 3, it says, And sang the song of God's servant Moses, of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Maybe your idea of worship is you just appreciate. You're out fishing and you just appreciate who he is. You're so thankful for who he is. But I can tell you without a doubt that every one of us were created to worship him. And I'll even go as far as to say this, believer and non-believer. And what I tell my students is, listen, you'll worship God one way or the other. Whether it be through his just and his holiness on the day of judgment or whether it be through your loving relationship with him. But you will worship God one way or the other. And I can tell you which side I want to be on. And what I'm saying is, what my message is to today is, man, God sang the first song. God created us to sing a new song and follow all of eternity we're going to be singing a song. And John 14, 423, which paints the entire picture. But the hour is coming. Because we know Christ is coming back for us. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship. The Father in the spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Man, God's looking. Man, he's looking for people that just want to cry out and proclaim his name. You know, I often wonder how I got to where I am. I tell you, I feel like a tortoise on a fence post, but sometimes I wonder, maybe it's just because I'm willing to say that he is worth it. And maybe God wants you to do the same. Maybe God is looking for people who are willing to step up in their workplaces to say he is worth it. Maybe he's looking for people who are just willing to praise him, and so my message is, my invitation for you this morning is this. Maybe some of you in here, I don't know, but maybe you've never, ever sang that kind of praise to God before. I would like to challenge you this. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, I want to tell you you were created to worship him. God created you with a purpose, and it was to proclaim his name all the way to the Great Commission where he says, go therefore to the ends of the earth baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, that verse is the last words that Jesus ever said to his disciples. And as believers, we ought to take it very seriously. And that means that I'm to worship him in all things and all purpose, and I'm to proclaim his name. There's nothing more important. There's nothing more that takes priority. And maybe you've never worshiped God like that. 
If you've never worshiped God like that, I always do this. I never want to miss an opportunity to give you an opportunity to understand grace. Because I think, as most studies show, it takes about 11 times someone to hear the grace about grace before they truly understand what grace is. And it's like we can grow up hearing about it until we really get it. We don't get it. Because grace is a relation, it starts a relationship with Christ. I always tell my students it works like this. Mercy is something that you're given in a sense of that they hold back. But grace is so much more than that. You see, I love the word grace because I think it's this. Not only are you being shown mercy, but then you're given a gift on top of it. You'll be given a gift that you don't deserve. And I love that word grace. And it's the word that keeps me going. It's just the word that keeps me going over and over again, preaching the same, just preaching, preaching this good news. And so maybe you've never understood what the word grace is, but here it is. Man, we, we've sinned against God. You were created to worship him, but you did something completely different. We sinned against God in such a way that, that, that set, us, set us where we would now be judged by God. And that judgment on, that God has for us, man, we're guilty. We've all fallen short and fallen short of the glory of God. We've missed the mark. But while we're still yet sinning, Christ died for us. It says that in Romans 5, 8. And then in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the d- dead, you will be saved. Man, I don't know about you, but God who's willing to extend grace even when I didn't deserve it, I want to worship that God. So my invitation for you today is maybe you don't have a relationship with with God. What I want you to do is we have these awesome places called Grace Place. At any point after the service, I just want you to go visit a Grace Place. Or if you feel comfortable, I'd be willing to talk to you. So I want, to, I want to challenge you with that challenge, those of us in, here, in this room who are believers, that we would look at the rest of this week as a week of worship, that we look at the rest of this week as an opportunity to share his good news to the rest of the world and to those around us, to our families. Hey, if you mess it up on Thanksgiving, Christmas is right around the corner. So there's a day of redemption for you. Those of us in this room who maybe don't have a relationship with Christ, my challenge is this, don't wait. Don't wait, because you can never, so many people out here say, I'll do it tomorrow, never do it. My invitation is that you would accept Jesus Christ here and today. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the people here. God, I thank you for the wonderful people that you've put in each and every one of our lives. As we go out of this room, God, I pray that we'd worship you in everything that we do from cooking, to proclaiming your name, to telling our friends about how great you are. God, I just pray that, that our hearts would be, would be deepened and our faith would grow stronger. In your name I pray, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to Uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.